Ladies, last time we were here, which was three weeks ago, Jeanette masterfully presented so much material to us and told us about Cyrus. We're going to hear a little bit more about Cyrus today. I will work in and out through the chapter about Cyrus, but she told us about the calling of Cyrus in Isaiah 44. She also told us Cyrus was identified over a century before he was born by Isaiah's prophecy. Uh, commentators don't always agree. Some say 200, some say 150, uh, some say 100, so I think it's safe to say over a century, <laughs> and that will include everybody and what they said. Of course, Isaiah's prophecy about the birth of Christ, 700 years ahead of that, was also true. Isaiah 44, 28, which she closed with last time, says, That saith of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be built, and to the temple, Thy foundation shall be laid. Now that's 44.28. 45.1 is right next to it. And we will begin because the Lord calls Cyrus his anointed. He just called him his shepherd and now he's calling him his anointed. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, sub to subdue nations before him. And I will loose the loins of kings to open before him the two-leaved gates, and the gates shall not be shut. I will go before thee and make the crooked places straight. As Cyrus the Great would conquer a kingdom, uh, of course there were gates to the city, but God was going to go before and open those gates. As a, To begin the study of this, which I started Five weeks ago, I always start the day I finished the one lesson before that, and I just started reading chapter 45 over and over and over again to see what it would speak to me, what would stand out to me in it. And many things did, and we're going to go through those things today, but two specific things stood out in my mind and in my heart as I just kept reading those chapters before I ever looked at any commentators, uh, what they said, or anything else. And that is that God has a master plan. Now everyone in this room who sews or does, does any kind of needlework or any kind of carpentry, I think Jeanette can do it all, but anything that you do, you usually have a pattern. Now, I know the women up in the costume room didn't always have a pattern. It always amazed me how they could come up with these tremendous costumes when they really didn't have a pattern to go by. But most people who do any kind of work like that have a pattern that they follow. They have a design. Well, God has a master plan for everything that happens in our lives and in the whole world. The second thing that really struck me, and we will talk about that toward the end, is he is God, we know that, and there is none other. And he makes that very clear to us in chapter 45. If we don't get anything else out of that chapter, we can get he is God and there is no one else beside him. I've divided the chapter into four points. God as the creator of the universe as sovereign Lord, as Savior of the world, and as a holy God, the only God. How many of you have ever been to a, an art museum and seen the tapestries on the wall? They are beautiful. Some are very old and sort of faded, but they are beautiful. Now, we're not allowed to touch those, but if we did, and we peeked behind, it isn't such a pretty sight. The front side is smooth and a beautiful picture of whatever 
the person wanted it to be. But on the back, there are threads hanging, there are all kinds of knots, and it's opaque. It's just you can't even really tell much what it is. And I wanted us to look at our lives today, and as we talk about chapter 4, as a tapestry. Someday we will see the upper side, and we will be happy, and we will glorify the Lord for all he has done. But there have been some knots and opaque places as we went through that we weren't able to know were coming. So someday we can look forward to seeing our tapestry from above. As creator of the universe, God has a master plan for everything and everyone, even centuries before he does it. And this should be a comfort to us. All of us who love the Lord, it should be a comfort to everyone. But I just had my neighbor who is, has had stage 4 cancer now for nine years. And she's amazing. But she was talking to me yesterday on the phone. We talk quite often. And uh, she just said, you know, it just, I don't know how people do it without the Lord. I just really don't. And uh, I said, you know, I don't either. I said, I said that especially 25 years ago, the first bout of cancer that I had. And I just thought, we lean so strongly on him for everything, not just illness, but problems in our lives and our family, finances, other things. And if you don't have the Lord, I don't know how they do it. And of course, she is always saying, I don't know how they do it. If it weren't for the Lord, I couldn't get through this. There's a poem that I love, and they said on, I, I, I researched all these, but that came from the Canadian Home Journal. I found it in a devotional book. <laughs> but it says, the shuttles of his purpose move to carry out his own design. Seek not too soon to disapprove his work, or yet assign dark motives when with silent tread you view some somber fold. For lo, within each darker thread, there twines a thread of gold. Spin cheerfully, not tearfully. He knows the way you plod. Spin carefully, spin prayerfully, but leave the thread with God. And people throughout history have done this. And I believe the very first lesson I taught, I referred to these same three examples that I'm going to refer to today, but everybody is so familiar with them. And Joseph is the first one. A young boy sold into slavery by his brothers. How frightened he must have been. Joseph didn't know that day how it was going to end many years later. So he, he went. He, he trusted the Lord, but such awful things happened to Joseph. First of all, he did well, he obeyed, and he advanced, and he finally ended up in Potiphar's house. And then Potiphar's wife tried to get him to sin, and he refused. And then she grabbed his cloak as he fled from temptation, and then he was thrown into prison. He didn't know whether he'd die in prison he was in prison for a long time because the men who got out of prim, uh, the one who got out of prison, who promised to tell them about the way he could interpret the dreams, forgot for a long, long time. Finally, he remembered, and then Joseph came from prison. He interpreted the dream, and therefore he was put in ahead of the storehouses and taking care of things to be ready for the famine. And then you know the story. His brothers came up to get food, and of course he recognized them right away, but they did not recognize him. And finally, before they left, he said in Genesis 45, 5, Now therefore be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that ye sold me hither. For God did send me before you to preserve life. So now it was not you that sent me hither, but God. That's true faith and trust in God's master plan. And then Daniel in chapter 6, and we all know that story, and it's been one of my favorite in, in the, 
I think it's called Eager Meyer Storybook that I grew up on and then bought a, an advanced copy of the same book for my children. It has a wonderful picture in there of Daniel uh, in the den of lions. But he was advanced to a high position even though he had been taken into slavery as a young boy. And the men were jealous of him and they got the king, and you know the story, to make a decree that everybody for so long could not pray to anybody but him. Now, what Daniel did, he could have gotten behind the window and prayed against the wall and they wouldn't have seen him, but the Bible says he prayed by the window as he was used, meaning he always prayed in front of an open window and he did that day as well, and of course that's what those men wanted, and they went right to the king and told him. Darius knew immediately he had been tricked, but he did not have the right, even as the king who had made the decree, he couldn't withdraw the decree. But he had faith to know that Daniel's God could protect him. And I'm sure when Daniel was thrown into that lion's den, there might be just one split second that... You know, you, you don't know how hungry those lions are and what might happen. But God shut the lions' mouths. And King Darius spent the entire night in prayer and fasting, and I'm sure pacing the floor, waiting till morning. But he did have enough faith in Daniel's God that he thought Daniel would be okay. So first thing in the morning, he's down at the lion's pit calling into Daniel did your God stop, you know, are you okay? And I don't think he was surprised probably when Daniel said, yes, I am fine. And then he made this decree. Everybody, all the dominions, everywhere must fear Daniel's God, for he is the living God. So Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. He had three friends who were sold into slavery when they were all young, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And of course, King Nebuchadnezzar built this huge statue of himself. And everyone was told in the kingdom, when you hear the music, you bow down. And of course, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego could not do that. And so what they did was keep standing while everybody else around them was kneeling. And... They were thrown into the fiery furnace, so hot that the men who threw them in the fiery furnace were burned. And then King Nebuchadnezzar said, didn't we throw three into there, and didn't we bind them? And they said, yes, and said, well, there are three men walking around unbound, and there's a fourth like unto the Son of God walking with them. This is what happened. When they came out, there wasn't even the smell of smoke on their clothes, uh, their, not a hair of their head was singed. And King Nebuchadnezzar said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree that every people, nation, and language which speech, speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And then he said they would be uh, killed. All three men were promoted in the, in the province of Babylon. So we see in all three cases, the boys trusted the Lord. They didn't know how it was going to end. God sees the end from the beginning. That's always a blessing. Sometimes we would like to but God does not give us that privilege. Someday we will. God revealed in chapter 45 the name of the coming conqueror, Cyrus the Great. And in verse 3, God promised Cyrus the treasures of darkness and riches from secret places, which referred to all the spoils that Cyrus would get. Because, of course, when you conquered a nation, you got all the people, but you got everything that they had and all of their gold and riches and everything else. The verse says, and I will give thee the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places that thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which call thee by thy name, am the God of Israel. 
in verse 7, God makes plain both light and dark threads in the tapestry of human history. He said in verse 7, I form the light and I create the darkness. I make peace and I create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. The commentators say that evil in this sense in this verse means tragedies, difficulties, or sorrow rather than evil as we look at it. However, those are results often of evil. So the Old Testament shows us God began everything, he maintains everything, and controls everything. And he does that because our second point says, as sovereign Lord, God does not want man to question his master plan. Isaiah 45, 9 through 13, warns all of us not to question God's sovereign plan. We are the clay and he is the potter. And Jeanette gave that example so beautifully last time, how you know, the clay can't make itself. It, it's the, the master potter who is creating that. Uh, it's very fascinating to watch somebody do that. When life begins to crumble around us, we need to remember God is on his throne. He sees, he knows all, he is omniscient, and he is sovereign. But how often do we question God? We do trust him, but how often do we question him about our finances, our health, uh, a relationship with someone at work or somebody in our home or just our lives in general. I think I've said this almost every time I've been up in front of you. There are no surprises to God, and you know that. There are lots of surprises to us, but there aren't any to God. There is a story, a legend that I love I think I was in college when I first read it. It's called The Legend of the Three Women. But there is a Christian woman who is asleep, and she dreams that she sees three women at prayer, kneeling. And then she sees the Lord come behind each of the three women. And the first woman, he leans over her, and he gives her tender, loving care. He talks to her. He encourages her and so forth, and then he moves on to the second one. And he goes and he touches her bowed head and says a few words of encouragement, but then passes on. And the third woman, he hardly speaks to. He seems to almost pass her abruptly. And in her dream, the woman is saying, oh my goodness, what did that third woman do? The first woman he really loves you know, he just was there for so long. And the second woman, he still loves, not quite as much as the first, but he did encourage her and touched her bowed head. And the third one, he just almost seemed to ignore. And while she was dreaming that, the Lord himself in her dream stood before her and said, Oh, woman, how wrongly hast thou interpreted this? The first woman needs all of my encouragement and tender care to keep her going on the right path and to keep her trusting me. And if I didn't just spend all the time leaning over her, she would fail and she'd fall. The second woman, trust me, she knows that everything I have for her is for good. She just needs a little encouragement along the way. And the third woman that you thought I abruptly passed and ignored is someone who trusts me so implicitly. And I am working very hard, tragic things in her life. But she never questions me. She accepts me and she goes on and does her will. I have to ask myself, which of the three women am I? <laughs> Am I one that keeps the Lord so busy just always hovering over me? And am I the second woman? I trust him, but I'm, you know, I have some questions and I need lots of encouragement. Or am I the third woman who just so totally trusts him? So I love that. I know it's a legend, but I do love that. 
Fanny Crosby, because of a mistake a doctor made, putting the wrong drops in her eyes, was made blind at birth. And this is what she wrote. I have heard that this physician never ceased expressing regret at the occurrence. She had been blinded through his mistake, and that is one of the sorrows of his life. But if I could meet him now, I would say thank you, thank you again and again for making me blind. Although it may have been a blunder on the physician's part, it was no mistake on God's. I verily believe it was his intentions that I should live my days in physical darkness so as to be better prepared to sing his praises and incite others to do so. And we know how many hundreds of hymns she wrote that have been such a blessing to us through the years so that she trusted that that's what God had for her. I taught a young man, I taught many young men and young ladies, about uh, 150 to 200 every year for 50 and a half years, 51 and a half years, so there were lots of them. But there was one that stood out, you always have that every once in a while, Greg Wright was one of those young men. It's not the one I'm going to talk about today. But So they're young men just on fire for the Lord. They can't wait to get out and serve the Lord. And one was Bobby McCoy. And he was such a wonderful student, and he just couldn't wait to serve the Lord. And before he graduated, he was serving the Lord. He had been out working in a church, and he was coming home and sitting at the stoplight outside the Welcome Center there at Bob Jones. And a car came careening through and hit him. And he said in his testimony, I knew immediately it was bad. I couldn't move anything, and I couldn't feel anything. And it took them a long time to pry him out of that car. And he spent many, many, many months in the hospital. Many of his fellow students were so kind to help him. The young men were very kind to help him. And uh, to this day, he is serving the Lord in his wheelchair. He can move his one arm, hand, so that he can move his wheelchair. He went ahead and got married to a beautiful Christian young woman that next year, and they are serving the Lord together. But Bobby knows that's what God had for him. And he has spoken in chapel and given that testimony and then I see him in the classroom up there talking and so excited about serving the Lord, but he's serving the Lord from his wheelchair. And then there was another young man. He wasn't in college. He was out of college, but he started having trouble with his eye, and he had to go to the doctor, and they had to do surgery. And all of you know Ron Hamilton, who is, if you probably knew him before he came to this church, but he and Shelley are in this church. And the night before his surgery, the doctor said, I don't know if I can save your eye. But Ron trusted him, and of course he couldn't save the eye. So while it was healing, he wore the patch over his eye. And one day, a little boy said to his mother, and you know children are never quiet when you want them to be. They, he said it very loudly, Mom, is that a real pirate? <laughs> and guess where pirate, a patch the pirate came from? He thought, oh, okay, I'm going to leave that patch on. And then all those wonderful uh, stories he's written, musicals for children and adults who have enjoyed it. We're going to see one in May, Patch the Pirate Goes to the Jungle. And so uh, Ron and Shelley knew that's what God had for them, and God used it in a mighty way. He also wrote the hymn at that time, God Never Moves Without Purpose or Plan, when trying his servant and molding a man, give thanks to the Lord, though your testing seems long. In darkness he giveth a song. Oh, rejoice in the Lord. He makes no mistake. He knoweth the end of each path that I take. For when I am tried and purified, I shall come forth as gold. Now God also had a plan and orchestrated the rise of Cyrus the Great. We learned many things about him last time. God went ahead of him in sovereign power, and he gave Cyrus empire after empire, riches after riches. God moved Cyrus to rebuild Jerusalem, 
and the temple and to free God's people and many other things. We're going to talk about the tapestry again for a moment. As sovereign Lord, remember that God weaves the tapestry of our lives. During World War II, during the tragic plight of the Jews, the Ten Boom family converted their home in Harlem, Holland, into a stopover for many Jews. Tucked away upstairs in the watch business the family had was a little room called The Hiding Place. You've seen the story, many of you, or the movie, or read it. But because such activities labeled them as enemies of the Nazis, Corey and her family were, would eventually be subject to imprisonment and torture in a notorious concentration camp. She wouldn't let anything deter her, though, from sharing God's word and his love, even in the most unthinkable circumstances. Now, following the war and until her death, Corey Ten Boone traveled to 60 countries and would give talks telling everybody of the love of the Lord. And one thing she loved to do, she had two ways she started every talk, but this was her favorite. She would hold up a rough blue cloth that had tangled knots of golden thread hanging from it. And then she would recite a poem entitled The Master Weaver's Plan. Now, some books say that she wrote this. Others say it's anonymous. And uh, I read that one man said, my great-grandfather wrote that poem. So I, I don't know why they all say it's anonymous or that Corey Ten Boone wrote it. So I don't know, but I know she loved to quote it. My life is like a weaving between my God and me. I do not choose the colors he weaveth steadily. Oft times he weaveth sorrow, and I in foolish pride forget he sees the upper and I the underside. Not till the loom is silent and the shuttle cease to fly will God unroll the canvas and explain the reason why the dark threads are as needful in the skillful weaver's hand as the threads of gold and silver in the pattern he had planned. And when she finished reading that poem, she would flip over that piece of cloth and they'd all see a beautiful blue cloth with a gold crown on it. And that's the way she started most of the times when she taught. And then we have the Savior of the world, God's master plan for the glory of salvation. And that is all through this chapter 45. God planned to use Cyrus' conquest to advance his master plan for the salvation of every nation, including the Jews first, but not only the Jews. Isaiah 45, 8 carries the theme to shower righteousness so that salvation and righteousness may prevail. Drop down, ye heavens, from above, and let the skies pour down righteousness. Let the earth open, and let them bring forth salvation, and let righteousness spring up together. I, the Lord, have created it. Isaiah 45, 17 to 22 gives us a clear picture of the glory and the mystery of God's salvation. Isaiah 45, 18 to 25 shows us that God can accomplish this glorious plan by proclaiming the truth to all of the world. Isaiah 45, 18 shows us God's eternal purpose. For thus saith the Lord who created the heavens, God himself who formed the earth and made it, he hath established it, he created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord, and there is none else. And then the fourth point, which I tried to merge point three and four, but they, there was a little different way of doing it. So as a holy God, his master plan is revealed because there is no other God. He wants to keep that thought before us. Now, in Isaiah 45, he uses the phrase, I am God and there is no other, or I am God and there is none else, ten times in that one chapter. 
Verse 3b, I, the Lord, which call thee by thy name, am the God of Israel. Verse 5, I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God beside me. Verse 6b, there is none beside me. I am the Lord, and there is none else. Verse 14b, there is none else. 18b, I am the Lord, and there is none else. 21b, and there is no God else beside me. A just God and a Savior, there is none beside me. And 22b, for I am God and there is none else. Now by the time you finish reading all of those, and I mark them all in red in my Bible, several of them sometimes are in the same verse or the same little section, <coughs> but I would put a little asterisk by it and then a number. And then I went back and recounted them to make sure that, that there were 10 and I was counting it right. Isaiah 45, 22 shows us how powerful and simple salvation is. Look unto me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. <coughs> to look means to turn our eyes on the Lord, who is the only one who can help us or save us. Turn your eyes upon Jesus Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And when you have a real terrible problem, and you're just so upset about it, and you spend time with the Lord and get your focus on God, turn your eyes upon Jesus, everything else becomes dim in comparison. The four-letter word, L-O-O-K, -okay, is what the Holy Spirit uses to reach the lost. Look to the throne and be saved. Now, in the, in the front of your chapter this time, it's talking about Spurgeon and his testimony, and I have several places. So I have taken some of that, but I've also put in Spurgeon's own words what this verse meant to him. Charles Haddon Spurgeon was out one night and went to this church on January 6, 1850 in a snowstorm. Uh, the preacher wasn't able to get there because of the weather and so one of the, women, one of the men who worked there got up and decided to teach the lesson, preach, but he didn't, he, he says in his words, he was an ignorant man, he didn't know very much. But he knew this one verse and he stuck to it over and over again, Isaiah 45, 22, look unto me and be saved all the ends of the earth. The preacher looked at young Spurgeon and said, young man, you're very miserable. Young man, look in God's name, look and look now. Spurgeon said, I did look, blessed be God. I know I looked then and there and he who but that minute before had been near despair had the fullness of joy because that man just kept repeating the same verse over and over and over. Uh, the children of Israel complained, surprise, surprise. They had promised God, if you will deliver the enemy to us, you know, we will worship you and we will obey you and so forth And uh, in Numbers 21. And so God did that. And then soon thereafter, they started complaining and they complained against Moses and against God. And so God let there be serpents, snakes come around <laughs> and started biting the people. And some of them died from it. And then, of course, then they want to, oh, you know, forgive us. We'll... And so God told Moses to lift up an image on a pole of a bronze serpent and any person who looked at that serpent would be saved from death from the snake bite. All we have to do is look to the Lord and we will be saved. Galatians 3.28 states, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. We can't do anything to earn our salvation. What we do is trust and believe and ask 
Jesus to forgive us our sins and come into our hearts. John 14, 6, Jesus saith unto them, and I think every, every one of us probably, if we grew up in a Christian home, learned this right away. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Acts 4.12 Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Isaiah 45.23 I have sworn by myself, the word is gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. Now that's in 45.23. Philippians 2, 10 through 11 says the same thing, but we're more familiar and probably quote that more, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, as we have looked through this, and we learned last week how God used Cyrus, and we looked at that a few times today uh, in chapter 45 as well, how God orchestrated, he had a master plan. Now, Cyrus did not know the Lord as far as we know. Jeanette said that last time, and one, the commentators don't all necessarily agree on that. I don't know if they ever agree on just totally everything, but uh, I saw several different things. But as far as we know, he never gave his heart to the Lord, but he did obey uh, the Lord. So we've studied about Christ, the Creator, the sovereignty of God, Christ as our Savior, and Christ the Holy One and the only God. We've looked at men in the Bible and men in history, modern day people who completely trusted God's master plan for their lives. We've seen how Isaiah prophesied about Cyrus the Great more than a century before he was born and called him by name. We've seen how God used and orchestrated Cyrus to build the temple, to conquer the nations, to free Israel, and many other specific acts. Now, what do we need to keep in mind? That God has a master plan for everybody in this room. He's had that master plan since before we were formed in our mother's womb. He knows how many days he's going to give us on this earth. Uh, he knows what's going to happen to us the good things as well as those things that are working for our good. They may not be good in the sense that we would call them good. He can use anyone and everyone who loves him to fulfill his plan. There's no one who ought to be put on the shelf not doing anything because God has a plan and he can use anyone. And he sees the whole picture. Let's keep that in mind. I'm just reviewing with you what we've said today. And he's holy. We must fully and completely trust and worship him. Our daughter, Christy, sings in a trio. They, they've sung for many years together, and they sang on the Morningside's CD, Glorified. I almost forgot the name of it. But they, they sang this song, and Karen Darst, who sings it, and Julie Carrier, and our daughter, Christy Perry. But... Often, I say, when are you all going to sing that song again? I just love that song. And Karen says, we're going to sing it and stand up and say, this is dedicated to Coretta Because <laughs> I've asked so many times, and they have not sung it for a while. Trust the one who's walking on the water. Trust the one who's leading through the storm. When you cannot see the shoreline, when there is no home in sight, would you focus on the certainty that all will be all right? Trust in him who made the tempest. Trust in him though tossed and torn. Trust in him who walks on water in your storm. And there is someone, and I'm going to close with this if I can, who totally 
trusted the Lord in the circumstances. We all know that this week, Beneth Jones, this past week, went home to be with the Lord. I've known Beneth since she coached me in a contest when I was 13 years old. And I just thought, oh, if I could just be like Beneth Jones. Oh, she was Beneth Peters at the time. And I thought, oh, she's got such a beautiful voice. I was shocked when they said that at her funeral about her voice, because I thought, oh, she's always been my example of a beautiful, beautiful voice. But just before she passed away, and many of you saw this, I know, but I just want to remind us, Dr. Bob III sent something out that they posted for the faculty and staff first, and then they were going to put on uh, the Facebook. And I'm just going to read you a couple of things that he said. I'm not going to read you the whole thing. Psalm 31:15, my times are in his hands. When my wife's oncologist told Beneth Thursday, January 31st, 2019, that her lymphoma was raging and no longer treatable, she and I, along with our three children, Roxanne, Bob, and Stephen, received great comfort to be reminded by this verse that the remaining days of her earthly existence, which seemed to be drawing swiftly to a close, will be in, under the control of her omniscient, all-knowing, he knew from the very beginning of Beneth's life, divine, sovereign, designer, even as each of her 81 earthly years has been. I cannot tell you how, how eager she is to begin her eternal day, for which she has been prepared since the age of nine, when her Redeemer clothed her in his righteousness, provided through his blood for her more than 2,000 years ago, it is well with her soul. And of course, she passed away two days later on February the 2nd after they got that news. But the omniscient divine designer, and he knows all about us, he has designed our lives with a master plan and a beautiful tapestry that we only see the underside for right now. And someday, when we are in glory, we will, we will know all of what he had planned for us. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for the time we've had together today. We thank you for the discussion groups, the questions that were answered. We thank you for the prayer time. And we ask that for all those who were prayed for, that you will meet every need as you have promised to do. We ask that we would be like the third lady in that woman's dream and trust you so implicitly that no matter what happens, we will not question, we will not fret, we will not worry over it, but we will completely trust you. Uh, we thank you for Isaiah, and this book that we have been studying, we thank you for Cyrus and all the lessons that we learned both last time and this time about Cyrus and how you prepared him. You made the crooked way straight and you went before him. And we thank you for that. Uh, we thank you that whatever our storm is, you have allowed the storm and we need to trust you as the one walking on the water and preparing everything in our lives. Uh, we thank you for the wonderful blessing that Beneth Jones was to those of us in this room who knew her. We thank you for the wonderful testimony of the family uh, through this last week and a half. And we ask that we would also trust you and be the kind of people <coughs> who can say you are omniscient, you have a divine design for us. For Jesus' sake, amen.